Good afternoon from Vienna and good morning to New York. Welcome to today's edition of the FIW Trade Talks, an online event series in which we are discussing pressing questions on trade and economic policies with internationally renowned scientists and scholars. My name is Harold Oberhof and I'm your host today. The FIW Trade Talks are financially supported by the Austrian Ministry of Labor and Economy, for which we are very grateful. Before moving to the, today's topic, as usual, let me briefly remind you about our housekeeping rules for the trade talks. So the trade talks will start with the 15 to 20 minutes input uh, by our guest. And after that, we will have a discussion. And I guess today, a very lively discussion on the topic until five o'clock Central U uh, European time. Um, you can participate in this discussion as well, and you can participate by posting your questions into the Q&A section in the Zoom call, I will select cluster these questions somehow and will bring, bring them to our discussion. We are also recording this uh, trade talk uh, and we will post the video of the talk on our FIW homepage as well as on YouTube over the next couple of days. And finally, after the seminar, you will receive a short feedback questionnaire, and we would be very happy if you could give us some feedback on how we can further improve our events and especially for today, the trade talks format. Now, having said that, I would like to jump into our topic. Today, we're talking uh, about the so-called Brussels effect. The Brussels effect deals with the, EU, with the EU's potential ability to use its regulatory power for international standard setting in various different policy fields, including, for example, production standards, product safety, environmental standards, but also on the regulation of digital markets, which we're going to hear more today due to new research by our guest. I'm very happy now to introduce our guest. Um, I'm very well, I'm very happy to welcome Anu Bradford as our speaker today. Anu has coined the term Brussels effect in a very influential book from 2020. And therefore I cannot imagine something with the more expertise on this topic for discussing the Brussels effect with us today. Anu Bradford is Henry L. Moses, professor of law and international organizations at the Columbia Law School. She's also a director for the European Legal Studies Center and a senior scholar at Columbia Business School's Jeremy Chazen Institute for global business. Um, Anu earned her Doctor of Juridical Science and Master of Law degrees from Harvard Law School, and she also holds a law degree from the University of Helsinki. Her research focuses on EU law, international trade law, and comparative and international antitrust law. Before joining the faculty at Columbia in 2012, she was an assistant professor at the University of Chicago Law School. So a very, very exciting career, I would say. Congratulations on that uh, already uh, from my side. Now with this short introduction, I would like to hand over to you, Anu. Thank you very much for being with us today. Hello, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to share this conversation and good afternoon to um, everybody online. So let me maybe start with a few words on why I wrote this book. So the book is my rebuttal, if you like, or a response to this conventional thinking that the EU is an inevitably declining power, um, a continent whose best days are over, and uh, the EU that has very little ability to shape the affairs of the world. So that is not the EU that I encounter daily in my research and teaching. So let me give you just a few examples of what I mean by observing the EU's continuing global influence and relevance. So if we take, for instance, uh, the leading American tech companies. So if you think about the global data privacy policies of companies like Apple, Microsoft, Google, Meta, they have a single global privacy policy, which is drafted according to the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation of the EU. This also is the case when we think about how these American platforms are moderating content online. So companies like, again, uh, Meta, Meta's Facebook or Twitter or YouTube, they don't use the American constitution's definition of freedom of expression, the free speech. 
they use the European understanding of hate speech when they decide what kind of content they take down from their platforms. And it is not just the tech industry, and it's not just the American companies that are feeling the effects of European regulation. The EU regulation also determines how timber is harvested in Indonesia, what kind of pesticides African farmers use in their farms, what kind of chemicals Chinese, uh, well, what kind of, uh, I would say maybe Japanese toy manufacturers use in their toys, or what kind of facilities Chinese dairy factories are installing. So these are all examples where the European regulations are shaping the global practices of non-European companies. So this is what I call, as a, or what I define as the Brussels effect. So the Brussels uh, refers to European Union's unilateral ability to uh, influence and shape the global marketplace. So the EU is one of the largest and wealthiest consumer markets in the world. And there are very few global companies that can afford not to trade in the EU. So as the price for accessing the European market, these companies need to follow European law, all the European regulations. That is not surprising. But where it gets interesting is that often these companies choose to follow the European regulation across their global conduct and across their global production because they want to avoid the cost of complying with multiple different regulatory regimes. So by choosing to produce to the highest possible standard, which often is the European standard, these companies can have uniform production and have access to the markets across the world. So all the EU needs to do is to regulate the single market. It is then the business interests and the market forces uh, guiding these global companies that are transposing the European regulations across the world. So that's what I define, how I define the Brussels effect. But let's now ask the question, why the Brussels effect? Why not the Washington effect? Why not the Beijing effect? The EU is not the only significant economy around the world. So I think what the, the starting point in general is that we all know that you need to be a large market to be able to unilaterally set global standards. So let's say that you are Costa Rica and you want to shape the global environmental practices and you adopt very stringent environmental standards. If the global companies think that your standards are too costly, what do they do? They decide not to do business in Costa Rica, but it is much harder not to do business in important markets like the European Union. But that still doesn't answer my question, why not the Beijing effect or the Washington effect? Because those are also very large markets. Well, the, the Brussels effect theory argues that the, the large market is only a starting point. In order to be a unilateral global regulator, you also need to have the regulatory institutions that you can help to unleash the power of those markets and transform it into concrete regulatory influence. And this is where Beijing is still behind Brussels. It doesn't yet have, it is building those, that regulatory capacity, but it doesn't yet have the experience and the expertise that resides in Brussels that would allow then China to ex uh, regulate extraterritorially to the same extent. Um, Washington, on the other hand, has plenty of regulatory capacity. But what is missing is the third condition, which is the political will to actually pass stringent regulations. So Americans don't want, or at least until recently have not wanted to use that regulatory uh, capacity and actually then uh, pass on stringent regulations. So they have in effect ceded the global stage for the EU to assume that role. So also the EU cannot, um, export all its regulations. The Brussels effect doesn't happen everywhere. And there are some additional constraints that I outline in the book. I think one that, that does a lot of work in the theory is I call it non-divisibility. So ultimately, the companies only choose the EU standard as the global standard if the benefits of doing so exceed the cost. So if it is too costly to customize their production for different markets, then they go for standardization.
But there are instances where they, for instance, decide that I am running two different production lines and I am dividing my production across different markets. That's when the Brussels effect does not happen. So the precondition is really the company's calculus, that even if they don't love the Brussels standard, they're still better off adhering to that standard and not take advantage of lower standards elsewhere. So let me know, I'm, I'm eager to open it up for questions soon, but I'm just gonna touch on a few issues. And one of them is whether this is a good or bad thing. So the book is a descriptive um, uh, account of the EU's power, explaining that it's relevant, whether you like it or not, but it does pose some important normative questions. So should we be celebrating uh, the, the, the Brussels effect or is that a reason for concern? So obviously for the Europeans, it's generally a very good thing because it levels the playing field and then helps the European companies that don't now need to take a hit if they are the ones adhering to higher regulatory standards. If they competitors across the world also adhere to those standards, then they are, their competitive position is relatively better. So that's a good thing. But what about then um, American consumers, African farmers, all those other stakeholders that basically are the recipients of uh, the EU's uh, rulemaking? So there can be a few criticisms that I, I, I address in the book. One of them is that there is this persistent thinking that regulation increases costs and reduces innovation. If that is the case, then the Brussels effect multiplies those costs, and that can obviously globally deter innovation. Another criticism uh, is that um, there is also the kind of protectionist argument, the idea that maybe the EU regulation is driven by the kind of nationalist, for instance, envy-driven protectionist motives. It's trying to take down the American tech giants because it cannot produce those giants on its own. If that is the case, we are only exporting protectionist regulations, and that obviously would be a problem. I argue in the book that up until very recently, I don't think that has been a motivation driving the European regulatory agenda. But the geopolitical situation has changed quite dramatically in the last two years, and I'd be very eager to engage in the conversation whether that is also shifting in the EU's uh, thinking these days. But I do mention the third potential criticism that I think we all need to take seriously. And that is the more political accusation of regulatory imperialism. The idea that the EU is now exporting its standards to the rest of the world and the foreign consumers, for instance, are now paying more for the products, even if they did not value data protection or environmental protection at the same level as Europeans do. So foreign governments are stripped of their democratic ability to respond to the preferences of their own constituencies. So that's one uh, criticism. There, you can rebut that or try to counter that with a few potential arguments. One is that when it comes to measures, for instance, that the EU is taking to combat climate change, the EU can portray itself as a global regulatory hegemon that ultimately is providing a global public good. That still, may be a little bit more of a regulatory paternalist argument that some people are uncomfortable with. I think the strongest defense that the EU has is that the Brussels effect is not an intentional strategy. It is basically a response by foreign companies. All the EU is doing is regulating the single market, which it has the sovereign right, even an obligation to do. And if then a company like Meta decides to apply those rules outside of the EU, that is Meta's decision. That is not the EU's decision. And that is not how we conventionally think about regulatory imperialism. So those are some of the normative considerations that I would invite you to, to think about. I think another conversation that is really interesting is what is the future of the, the Brussels effect? And I don't wanna exhaust that conversation, but maybe offer a few thoughts. So since I wrote the book, the world has changed quite dramatically. Um, so we've had COVID-19, we have had a tremendous dis disruption in global supply chains, um, the intensi uh, intensified trade and tech war between US and China, we've had the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So there are questions as to what is the next uh, phase of globalization and with that also the globalization of regulation.
So one thing that we can certainly observe that the EU's regulatory activity is not slowing down. So if we take the tech field, for instance, there's been tremendously ambitious regulatory agenda, Digital Markets Act, Digital Services Act, new regulations in preparation, including on artificial intelligence, directive on platform workers, data act, you name it. There is a lot going on. And one question is whether those regulations will actually have a global impact, something that we can discuss. Um, but there's also this growing geopolitization of trade policy and potentially regulatory policy. So the EU is not just talking about its traditional values guiding its regulation, but it's also regulating with the view of the more uncertain geopolitical environment that has brought concepts like strategic autonomy and, and um, you know, digital sovereignty at the center of the decision making. So one interesting question is whether that will change the nature of the regulations that emanate from Brussels and what does that mean for global trade and globalization more broadly. So I could go on, Harold, but I'm really keen to open it up so we can we can continue by way of a conversation, if that's fine with you. That's perfectly fine, Anu. Thank you very much. I think you opened a, a large box for a lot of different topics uh, to discuss. Um, maybe, uh, first of all, I again invite all the participants to post their questions in the Q&A section, and I will include them. Maybe while you're writing, um, I start with one very practical question. Um, as you mentioned, all the impressive examples of successful EU regulation that has been basically taken by all other foreign countries, especially also in the dig digital markets and the tech giants. And uh, so, so maybe just start with a very small practical question. In, in Europe, we now have a lot of discussions on the new owner of Twitter, for example, and, and his, uh, his changes with Twitter as a company, and as we both are on Twitter, so would you would you would you say that we are fearing too much because Twitter will in any way um, um, accept the European regulation and it will not be a, just a forum for hate speech in twenty days or something like that? So I don't think Harold that Twitter has a choice. It was really interesting the day that Elon Musk finally concluded his deal, his tweet, uh, he tweeted by saying the bird is freed. And I think with the sort of not only announcing that the deal is closed, but also announcing what is his policy when it comes to a rather absolutist view on free speech, which contradicts often the European way of regulating mm -hmm. these platforms. So the European Commission didn't take a long time to respond. It was next morning, there was a tweet from uh, Commissioner Preton saying, well, in Europe, the bird will fly by our rules. Mm -hmm. And I would say my money is on Brussels. There is no way that Twitter can get away trying to dictate its own rules uh, for uh, the, the, the digital space. Also, the European New Digital Services Act, it's not a voluntary code that has been currently covering uh, the, the, uh, the hate speech, for instance. It is a binding regulation packed by significant sanctions that basically force that Twitter to adhere to the European rules or Twitter will face sanctions. And ultimately, the European regulators have the power to abandon Twitter from the European uh, market. So in that sense, I think uh, there can be a lot of talk. There can be a lot of kind of posturing of, of what Elon Musk's view of the digital economy ought to be. But at the same time, he needs to play by European rules if he wants to operate in Brussels. Yep. Thanks. But just a very brief follow up. Would you then think that this will induce a kind of uh, divergence in regulation so that Twitter would look different in terms of regulation in the US and elsewhere in the world as compared to for European Union customers? So there's already some degree of divisibility, the term that I'm using, that these platforms are doing some country-specific filtering. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there's been policies. I remember when Facebook once uh, mentioned that why they don't want to have a different uh, sort of hate speech policy, for instance, for every single jurisdiction, because they are global platform. They want to facilitate global conversations. The same thing that if you and I are having a conversation on Facebook or Twitter, 
We don't want a conversation where you see part of the conversation and I see part of the conversation and it's completely balkanized. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you basically would need to have only national conversations. And that's why Facebook said, look, we are a global platform. We facilitate global conversations and we cannot have everybody see a different part of that. So I think there are limits to how far the platforms are willing to do to completely start balkanizing these, these conversations. And also, I would say that the rhetoric around free speech and the regulation of these platforms in the U.S. has shifted quite dramatically. So there was a time when Americans were very broadly committed to the kind of techno-libertarian free speech at all cost philosophy. But I think there's been enough instances where the Americans have understood that free speech no longer serves you know, democracy in this country, the healthy conversations, it, they kind of, it, it's, it's a rather far cry from the initial promise of what the internet ought to do to sort of empower individuals and strengthen our democratic conversations. And there's a lot of pressure even in the United States Congress to start regulating these platforms more tightly. Americans don't want to be subjected to that amount of hate speech either. So I think in that sense, I would say that I don't expect the Americans to take a radically different approach because that's not where the political conversation is these days. That's not where, if you look at the public surveys and the public opinion in the United States, they want more regulation. The question is that the U.S. Congress still remains dysfunctional. So whether we see a sort of fundamental rewriting of the regulatory frameworks, I doubt it. But, uh, but there are various pressures that are pushing these companies towards more of the European style uh, uh, code of conduct. So you would say that there might be a change in the political will with respect to regulation in the US, especially with respect to digital markets, if I get you right. Uh, so um, maybe just uh, in case you're interested in more on digital markets from the audience perspective, please feel free to ask your questions because Anna is just concluding her new book where she had been working two years on digital markets a lot. So it's a good opportunity to ask everything on, on digital market, tech market regulation you ever wanted to ask. Uh, we may come back to the digital market in specific, but uh, for the moment, I would now just like to move to some first questions from the Q&A because they are also some kind of conceptional in a sense for our understanding for the ongoing a debate. So Manfred Jekyllin from, from the Ministry, um, first of all, thanks you for your excellent introduction into the very interesting concept of the Brussels effect. And his first question, he already has three, but his first question is about the concept. And he asked, does your thinking only apply to technical standards and regulation or also to value-based regulations, for instance, regarding human rights and forced labor? because that's also obviously a very important topic right now uh, with all the debate and regulating of supply chains and enforcing uh, um, that the companies take care about also those kind of uh, standards that they need to, to, to check in their supply chains. Um, so no, that's a, that's a terrific uh, question. So I would say that in most instances, I don't separate the values from regulation. So if you think about, we now talked about the GDPR, that is fundamentally about values as well. The value, the fundamental right to data privacy. Also, if you think about many other uh, regulations about artificial intelligence, that's also about the value, non-discrimination, that kind of rights-based regulation, which is very value-driven. A lot of the consumer protection, the regulation of GMOs, uh, the regulation of the chemicals, there are very deep environmental views that are embedded in, into those regulations. There are some regulations, if you think about sort of technical standards that are truly technical, the way we think about certain plugs and the compatibility of some, uh, some forms of electronics, they may be a little bit more kind of value neutral, if you like. But I think generally that the European regulations do embody a set of values that, for instance, in its tech regulation, advances kind of human-centric, rights-protective, more fairness-driven notion. The same thing with antitrust. I don't think in the Europe it's just an economic regulation. There's a certain concept of the notion of fairness and redistribution from large companies to smaller and medium-sized companies, for instance, that is now driving the, the tech regulation that is quite value-based. But the, the particular examples that you mentioned, I think, are illustrated because there are limits to what the EU can do when it comes to 
to value-based uh, regulations like forced labor, human rights more broadly. The EU's tool that it's using when it comes to Brussels effect is access to its markets. And there are many practices around the world where there's, for instance, human rights violations, but they cannot be sort of embedded in the products in a way that the EU can counter them on the border. So the EU is doing additional work to try to export its notion of human rights practices. So if there is forced labor in China, but you do not have that forced labor document, you cannot document that it's embedded into those productions and you find a legislative basis to use regulation to counter the importation of those products. The EU cannot change those human rights practices, especially with respect to you know, products and, and, and conduct that remains uh, outside of the EU borders. So I would say that the Brussels effect is just one among the many tools that the EU is using. And sometimes the EU needs to spend more political capital, more sort of diplomatic uh, power that it has to try to um, sort of nudge uh, or even try to incentivize uh, with some, some form of sanctions a, a change outside of the EU. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, you, I think you already touched on the next question a bit, but let me just rephrase it again, because then we also maybe have a nice example to illustrate this point here. Uh, so that the second question is on, on trade policies and new measures that the EU is imposing. So the question is, does the fact that the EU has begun to use trade policies, trade agreements to promote its standards, change something regarding the internal market narrative? Um, or do you think that measures like CBAM are necessary next steps? Because CBAM would actually be something you, you already mentioned with, uh, if I don't get you wrong, about nudging other countries to basically follow our regulation in a more accurate manner. Yes. So I would say um, I would probably have a little bit more qualified view as to the extent to which the U.S. is harnessing trade policy to promote its standards. There are changes in U.S. trade policy. I'm mainly watching now this increasing move towards a move away from this free trade dogma mm -hmm. and uh, to be more kind of nationalist uh, by American is kind of entrenched everywhere. And if you look at heavy subsidization of key sectors of the economy, so I think there is certainly a shift in U.S. trade policy. But whether the U.S. is as effectively using the trade agreements to export its standards, it still doesn't have the kind of, it hasn't replicated the same kind of network of trade agreements and the depth of those standards that the European trade agreements are um, exporting to the rest of the world. Um, but there is certainly, I, I think, a lot that, and that's not to say that the U.S. doesn't have any influence. It has a lot of influence over financial regulation, its ability to actually weaponize its financial markets. So there are many ways that I would not underestimate the power that the U.S. has. And also the more coercive uh, measures that the U.S. is now taking to restrict exports using secondary sanctions. So there's a lot of leverage that the U.S. is seeking to, to use. Um, I want to seize a little bit on the, the second question of CBAM, and for those who are not familiar with the acronym, it, it refers to the, the, uh, the, the basically the border adjustment when it comes to carbon embedded in, in the products that are being imported uh, into the EU. So the EU is trying to level the playing field and make sure that if the EU has very stringent uh, climate change uh, uh, regulations, also then um, the foreign producers uh, would need to face that. And that's one of those that I, I think the EU needs to go beyond the Brussels effect. And the CBAM is not exactly only market driven. It is a trade policy instrument harnessed to further regulatory goals. Um, so it's a little bit more controversial in that sense. It's, it's different from my example. If EU regulates the, the market and Facebook decides voluntarily to adhere to the EU standards, CBAM has a coercive element in it. And it's very important that it's implemented in the way that is consistent with the trade regime. Otherwise, it undermines the EU's strong commitment to the WTO and rule-based international order. But I've advocated before, and I still continue to think that climate change is one of the most sort of existential questions for us to solve. And the EU generally doesn't just need to be a unilateralist. The EU is also trying to get a multilateral commitment to those measures that help solve climate change. But if that doesn't happen, the EU is willing to go along. And this may be one of the battles that I think it's worth fighting. It is really important that there will be a global adjustment. The EU cannot alone solve climate change. So the idea is that the CBAM, even the threat of it, is nudging countries to adopt the local measures so that there is no need to adjust 
uh, the, the tariffs on the border. But I think it is an important part of the broader policy tool alongside with other measures that the EU is taking. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Maybe just a follow up on, on CBAM because there, there is also, well, related to CBAM and basically connected to it, some economists would argue to have some kind of climate club, right? So where basically all of the member states of this climate club in a multi, more multilateral or bilateral way, so at least with the US, I would say, should form this climate club where they agree on minimum um, prices for CO2 emissions. And once those countries apply to those minimum rules, then you have uh, yeah. CBAM free, so adjustment free trade across this uh, this this new club in terms of, uh, of of climate policy. Do you think that would be possible? So, especially from the U.S. perspective, as you're sitting in New York, do you think the U.S. would be interested in joining such a club with the EU? So I would like to think that there's a lot of uncertainty of the future of the U.S. politics. So right now we, we don't know who is going to be in the White House two years from now. We've seen, I think, the Europeans are still scarred from the four years of Trump presidency, yeah. where certainly environment, climate change, we're not anywhere close to the, the agenda. And, and there's still many in the sort of the echelons of power in the U.S. Congress that are not as committed to fighting climate change. But if you look at the, the agenda of Biden administration. It is committed uh, to, to uh, climate change is an important policy priority. I think the challenge with this administration is that there are many policy priorities. There's many issues that are really salient. And, and if you think about the geopolitical uh, uh, sort of uh, difficulties relating to Russia and China, they are taking a lot of the energy. And the energy crisis right now uh, uh, that was fueled by uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine is kind of uh, changing the calculus in, in what are the policy tools available to fight the climate change. So we also are trying to fight inflation. We are trying to figure out our, how our way, uh, our way out of the energy crisis. But fundamentally, as a value matter, this administration believes in the importance of addressing climate change. So I would not be prepared to say that the U.S. would not be open to it. I think the U.S. has an inconsistent record to some extent. And if you look at now the unilateral measures on subsidizing the U.S. producers to the extent that, that there's an American response, an American policy to fight climate change, which has then caused trade tensions with the, with the, the U.S., I cannot say that the Europeans can count on American cooperation, but I think they should pursue that. And I think there is a way to formulate it where there is a, there is a set of common interests that, that countries like the US and regions like the EU do share. There's a lot of um, attempts to cooperate in the form of trade and technology council. There's this kind of thinking that yes, we have our differences between the US and the EU, but the differences vis-a-vis -vis China are even more significant. And we need to find a way to collaborate among the like-minded countries. So it's a long way of answering that I don't think it's guaranteed, but I think it is plausible and certainly worth exploring. Mm -hmm. Great, that, that I think already uh, replies to one further question, which was basically on whether do you see some scope in EU, EU US cooperation on standards, so a kind of Brussels Washington effect, because that's from a European perspective, something that, that the proponents for trade deal negotiations with the US, we're always arguing that if we can have um, a, a harmonized market in terms of regulation between the EU and the US, and those two giants in terms of income of, of, of households and consumers in those two economic areas would be so important that then everybody would apply these harmonized standards. But the problem as far as I see, or I understand is quite often that especially in many very critical products and, and goods, uh, harmonization or regulation be between the EU and the US are totally different, right? So if you just think about agriculture products, which is always difficult in any type of trade talks from a European perspective. Yeah. So look, it's, it's one of my favorite topics. I am a European living in the US, building my career here. I'm very committed to the transatlantic cooperation. And, um, and I... I I don't think we need to be naive about it. I don't think there's going to be a TTIP, the revival of the trade and investment partnership that was more sort of broad and ambitious in scope. I don't think there's that much value in rehashing some of the very entrenched 
areas of disagreement, whether it's GMOs or chlorine rinsed chicken or some of these very classic uh, beef hormones trade uh, disputes between the US and the EU. But there, there's a lot of sort of domain of the economy which still is not regulated, like artificial intelligence. There's still something that the US and the EU are both trying to find a way to regulate it. A lot when it comes to electronic, uh, like electric cars, for instance. So I think there's a lot of new domains of regulation where there's sort of similarities in the worldview, maybe um, sort of outweighing some of the differences, especially when you think about the third pole, the kind of Chinese view of using applications of AI uh, to conduct mass surveillance in a way that is really infringing of civil, civil liberties, that you find that the, the EU and the US could put aside some of their differences and realize that, yes, we have our combined market that we can leverage to really push the, the sort of the global standard setting to, to some direction. And we see a little bit in, when it comes to technical standards in many standard setting uh, organizations, the US and the EU have generally been quite dominant in those organizations, but China has been very smartly gaining more influ influence over standard setting. I talk mm -hmm. about technical standards, whether we talk about internet protocols, the international like telecommunications union, China is now chairing many of the, the working groups that are setting standards for like artificial intelligence. And the US and the EU had kind of been a little bit being caught unaware how much influence China has gained. And there's now an attempt for the two of them to work more closely together to try to rebalance it again so that they can advance their they joint interests. So I probably I, I'm falling somewhere between, I don't think there's gonna be a frictionless transatlantic um, trade relationship, but I think there are many reasons why the both parties, assuming we sort of continue with some degree of political stability in the US as well, uh, that there's certainly space and some bar bargaining zone for more, more sort of productive, deeper cooperation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, as you already mentioned, artificial intelligence, there is a question, especially on the Artificial Intelligence Act from Johan Kaas. Uh, do you think that the Brussels effect will also apply to the risk-based instead of rather value-based regulations from the past? So this is basically this different type of approach for regulation, right? Which makes also the discussions between US and EU always rather complicated on, on how to, to frame regulation in a more yeah. broad, broad scope, I would say. And so now the question would be, do you think this would work also for the AI? Yeah, no, very good. So I... I again would insist that it is a risk-based regulation. I completely agree, but it's also embodies many of the European values about ethics, about non-discrimination, um, and uh, sort of the, the, the human-centric view of how um, the, the technology serves humans and, and doesn't exploit uh, humans. But it is true that the, the particular way of embedding those values is to choose a risk-based approach. That's what the EU is, is proposing. And I, would think that the AI is one of the tricky domains. There are so many different applications of AI. So I don't think there's a single response that there's gonna be the Brussels effect across all the domains of AI or no Brussels effect. But I think there will be a set of applications where the Brussels effect will occur. And my main um, sort of argument for, for assuming that's the case is that the AI, the algorithms are generally, they rely on data sets. And the more data you have, the better your algorithms. So if you want to limit your compliance with the European risk-based regulation to Europe, then you basically need to train your data for the rest of the, the, the markets based on different data. There's a lot of data in Europe and you generally wouldn't like to discard that from building your algorithms elsewhere. So I think that temptation to idea that I want to have better algorithms, I'm going to use all the data. And if I don't divide the data based on different uh, uh, sort of jurisdictions, I can have better algorithms. And since I want to use European data, I need to abide by European rules. And they may be, imagine just, you know, thinking um, out loud, you are a um, global company that is using now algorithms to screen. Uh, so the human, um, human resources department is screening candidates for various positions and you use algorithms. So if you use that in Europe or you are bank determining who reserves credit, you have a lot of requirements on how you build your algorithms to make sure there's not unintentional bias in the hiring or access to loan. When you go around and develop those bias-free algorithms, I doubt you discard them and then use bias algorithms when you hire in the United States or Latin America. 
because ultimately these companies don't benefit from having uh, inferior quality algorithms for decisions like that, that also then expose them to liability elsewhere. So I think there are a few mechanisms through which we will see that the European approach towards AI also find its way to shape the global markets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th I think we're going to stay a little bit further within the, the digital markets. Obviously, a lot of people are interested in regulation of these new markets, which is not a big surprise, right? Because this is what we can now design and policymakers need to think about. And a lot of other regulation is somehow inherited in traditions or whatever. So um, there is two, there are two questions on, on tech and uh, regulation in in, in tech markets. So the first one from Franz Nauschnick would be whether you wouldn't think that the, the Brussels effect might be over, overestimated in tech sectors, which is dominated by US tech giant, uh, giants. And the second one is related to this, is related to the idea that we are regulating very, uh, in, in a rather strong manner as compared to other regions. So Agnes Kugler is asking, do you think that the EU regulations, especially in tech markets, might negatively affect innovations in the EU market or shift them to extra EU countries like China or or the the, the US. So the basic question is whether the, re the regulatory framework is too narrowly defined to allow for future innovations in markets where we don't yet know what kind of products we still can develop there. No, so I think that's a really important question. I thought about it a lot because I often get this question. So where are the European tech giants? Is it just because the Europeans regulate them so much? But actually, who's been the target of European regulation? It's been a lot of American companies, and they still continue to innovate. And if you think about the sort of the EU lagging behind in AI startups, there is no AI regulation in force right now in the EU, yet those companies are rather established elsewhere. So let me be very clear, all regulation is not good. And there's certainly regulation that has the capability to impede innovation. And I am not proponent of all European regulations or saying that they're all necessarily uh, uh, as sort of pro-innovation as they could be. But I'm reluctant to believe that categorically, the regulation is the reason why Europeans have not been as successful in innovating. So let me offer you four alternative reasons why I think there are no European tech giants. So first, there is no real digital single market that is complete. That's still, the European market is still much more fragmented. So you are a European startup. You need to internationalize much earlier than your American counterparts because you still have a lot of fragmentation. So you are a big company like, like Netflix. You have 30% cross-border availability in the EU. You download a movie in Austria and then you go to Belgium for a weekend and you may not be able to finish watching that movie. So that's not the kind of ecosystem where the companies can really scale and grow. The second is the money. So the capital markets union is rather incomplete. It's very different to raise funds in the US to support those innovations. Again, little to do with GDPR, much more to do about how capital markets work uh, in the EU. A third reason is that, that failing is fatal in Europe. Mm -hmm. So bankruptcy laws are absolutely brutal. Whereas in the US, it's kind of rite of passage. Okay, so you fail means you are ambitious, you try hard enough. Can I give you more money? And that just is not the thinking that really permeates the European uh, tech scene. And that I think then deters risk taking, which is absolutely essential for innovations. And then my, my fourth reason, and this is one of my favorite topics, because I really feel that without getting this right, the Europeans cannot be successful. One is the proactive immigration policy. If you look at the tech uh, giants in the US that we've talked a lot about, just think about the founders of these tech companies. So Steve Jobs, the founder of Apple, is a son of a Syrian immigrant. Um, Jeff Bezos is a second generation Cuban immigrant. Sergey Brin is Russian. Eduardo Saverin is Brazilian. Elon Musk is South African. So this is not just homegrown innovation. Americans have been able to harness the best talent from around the world. So over 50% of $1 billion startups in the US have an immigrant founder. So the Europeans also need to realize that Europe needs to be made a destination, a welcoming destination for the best talent from around the world that innovate also for European benefits. So again, this is not a reason of regulation, it's 
who has the talent, who has the money, who has the risk uh, culture, and who has the kind of integrated large market where these companies can grow. So that's not, and, and let me go back, all regulation is not good, but I think there's many other issues that Europe needs to fix first before it starts rethinking whether it can protect individual rights through regulations like AI or GDPR. Mm -hmm. Well, um, thanks a lot for this detailed uh, answer. I think all, all the four points you raised are, are very valid and good points, and at least anecdotally, I would totally agree on that, right? And I would maybe also argue that especially this failing is fatal kind of tradition in Europe is also partially responsible for not uh, attracting talent, right? If, if you don't get risk money for investments, for innovation, then you might search for another place. And the U.S. has this kind of, yeah. um, this kind of at least people think that that's the case. You're going to the West Coast in the U.S. and they will give you a lot of money for whatever kind of funny idea you will, might have. Yeah. Um, however, if if um, if you just think a little bit more in depth about all those four things, I would argue, well, this is nothing we will be very, we will be changing very fastly, right? So um, would that then in your point of view imply that we will never have any digital giant and we will need to, to wait for the next uh, disruptive innovation to be competitive on new markets again and, and hope that this will be in a, in a market where we already have a single market? So I, I am an optimist. I don't think any of these are impossible to do. If the EU, if the EU is doing really hard things right now, would I ever have thought that we are rewriting the defense budgets mm -hmm. and basically overhauling our foreign and security policy the way we've done in the spate of a couple of months, basically? Mm -hmm. And so the EU is capable of doing very hard things. I think right now, and often through crisis, when you think about the movement towards like health union in the wake of the COVID um, and uh, other sort of big moments that have really pushed the EU to take hard reforms. Some of these like creating a digital single market, this is the core of what the EU does. It shouldn't be that hard. I think there's a lot of low hanging fruit there. There are some issues that are more controversial, and this worries me, for instance, when it comes to the more populist right-wing parties that are generally hostile to immigration. So the idea that, that immigration is, in some circles, a controversial topic, which is, I think, we also need to highlight very positive contributions. That, you know the, the, the work that economists have shown, for instance, how important immigration has been to, like, the Brexit idea was that the, U the UK is suffering if it is limiting uh, the, the, uh, the entry of uh, immigrants into the UK economy. They'd be very important for the country's economic success. So I think we need to sort of push back on a very simplistic narrative of what immigration means uh, for Europe and what kind of lost opportunities there are if we not more radically rethinking the foundations of our innovation culture. So I think it is our job as academics to continue to remind of the importance of those domains. Bankruptcy laws also, I think that just requires also the kind of shift. And if you look at the, I know you work with organizations like OECD, you look at studies by the OECD that is documenting where are the personal cost of failure. So basically bankruptcy costs the highest. You find uh, Sweden, Portugal, Czech Republic and other European countries. Where are they the lowest? It's countries like the United States. So we need to point out those correlations and, and critically think about the policies. And I think that the biggest fans and proponents of, of, of Europe, we have the special responsibility to sort of call Europe to do better in the in the domains and policies where I believe it is falling short. Yeah, thanks. But then maybe just look briefly on recent policies from the European Union. You already mentioned a couple of things. I, I would agree that in, in the European Union, we are always willing to change also dramatically our policies whenever we have uh, severe challenges, right? And something unexpected happens. So this is basically um, all, all, all the cri economic crisis over the last, uh, I would say 15, 20 years in the EU always had a strong response, but we're always just responding and not being very active, right? But yeah. one thing where it seems to be the European Union wants to be active Active is its new trade policy agenda with the label of strategic autonomy. So, um, do you think that this has any implications for the Brussels effect? Because if we are saying we want to, to bring production home, we want to be more independent from the rest of the world, 
then that might don't you think that that might lead to again re uh, regulational um, diversification uh, between different uh, regions that just increases costs and uh, uh, leads to deglobalization or something like that, which at the end of the day will just diminish the Brussels effect? So this is a really important question, Harold. So I'm, I'm glad you you raised this. So I think there's a there's no easy answer because the EU needs to be the EU cannot be naive. It needs to be attuned to the shifting regulatory environment and and sort of where the globalization is heading and how much they can trust the supply chains. I think we certainly need to heed to the lessons of European energy dependence on Russia. So it's hard for me to argue that we shouldn't think about strategic autonomy. So it depends how you define it. So creating a Europe with more capabilities and more resilience is a necessary and, and absolutely beneficial thing. We cannot, for instance, build the, the similar dependencies we built when it comes to energy and Russia, when it comes to technology and China. That is naive and that is just not, not how the EU should go about it. But at the same time, there are variants of this strategic autonomy where regulation is now harnessed more broadly towards the techno-nationalism and, and regulatory protectionism. And I don't think protectionism is the way that Europe will find its, its place uh, in the world and, and address some of its uh, deficiencies. And, and if we think about its connection to the Brussels effect, that there is certainly a temptation now to harness the Brussels effect for geopoli uh, geopolitics and, for instance, start enacting more protectionist regulations. So we see this, for instance, in competition policy, where there was a Franco-German manifesto for having more industrial policy way of allowing Europe to build European champions. So let's think about for a moment, if Europe does that, what happens to competition regulations around the world? we will face same kind of regulations emerging in different parts of the world. Now, European company wants to acquire one in Brazil. Guess what? They also believe in national champions and strategic autonomy and, and do not want to let that, that, that go forward. So I think we need to keep in mind that the Brussels effect and the European ability to influence global standard applies to good and bad regulations alike. And Europe could become then the export of protectionist regulations that I think then would come to haunt the European companies elsewhere as well. So I am not a believer on protectionism. I am a believer on greater capabilities and the kind of what I would say optimal amount of decoupling. Mm -hmm. So ultimately we need to still think about the, the efficiencies in having global markets and we cannot just sort of reshow everything. We can't imagine a Europe that produces and 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 uh, sort of supplies just for Europe, and and that's just not uh, not feasible. But um, that's why when you mentioned earlier, what about working with like-minded countries when it comes to climate change? That there needs to be hedging, there needs to be sort of rethinking of alliances. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think we need to tread very carefully when it comes to taking a leadership role in instilling the kind of fortness Europe and protectionist thinking um, as a way to rewriting the rules for the global marketplace. Mm -hmm. Related to this, um, so I, I would also agree that diversification is of course something that we need to learn from our dependence on Russian oil and gas and, and stuff like that. Um, but a related question to, to, uh, to this, uh, strategic autonomy and Brussels uh, regulatory capacity is um, from Bernhardt. He thinks about smaller economies in the neighborhood of the EU, such as the Western Balkans or Eastern Europe in general. Should, should, in your point of view, the European Commission pay more attention to the impact of its policies, not just like CBAM, have on these countries in light of other geopolitical actors like China or Turkey. So whether if we don't treat them well, they would just switch the camp, let's say. No, I, I think Europe needs to be absolutely attuned to whether, whether it's the neighboring domains, North Africa, Western Balkans, or whether we think about Africa, uh, big parts of Asia, Latin America, that are now, for instance, receiving tremendous infrastructure investment from China. So if I take again an example on the digital uh, space, China is offering many of these countries a path to digital development. And when the US is saying, don't take Huawei infrastructure, it's a tall order and a big ask from a country that basically knows that the Chinese uh, infrastructure is pretty good and it's affordable. So if 
Europeans and Americans don't offer an alternative, these countries will be choosing to cooperate with China. But the same thing, I think Euro the US in particular, cannot really cajole these countries to abandon China and then be very protectionist itself and say, well, actually, we are just providing subsidies and we have all these buy America policies, but choose us over China if China is giving them a better deal. So I think we absolutely need to be attuned to kind of geopolitical competition, regulatory competition, and think about sort of what is the, the, the what is that the Europe can offer to work in partnership with these countries and what alternatives these countries have if Europe kind of abandons these regions and, and their importance. And this is not just sort of economic growth and those opportunities. It's a big question of the political future. And I would say when it comes to sort of competing China's influence by building these digital infrastructures, it's also the kind of vision of a digital authoritarianism uh, that the more sort of techno democracies like the US and the EU need to need to combat when it comes to uh, sort of the regions um, that do have a choice and that are making choices about how they build their digital economies. So, so absolutely, whether it's near, whether it's far, Europe um, needs to sort of draw on the power that it has. It generally has been very good with partnership. It has been good with multilateral cooperation. And it can never sort of turn so much inwards with all its challenges that it would, it would um, ever forget the importance of those relations. Mm -hmm. So I have one question left, which perfectly fits to what you just said about uh, the neighboring countries where we sh should be particularly interested in cooperating more and offer alternatives uh, to, to the offers that China has to make. I would also agree that we are very passive, basically, on all those uh, countries in terms of trying to get, get better economic and regulatory um, regulation and, and, and cooperation together. But but this, this, as you have already said in your introductory statement, this also quite often, especially in democracies, brings this kind of idea that this is imperialism, right? So we're regulating and everybody has to take that. And here uh, Manfred Czechulin has, has a question or basically does not really understand why sh that should be the case, because due to the extent of the Brussels effect mainly works by affecting the behavior of companies, how does that undercut the democratic power for uh, foreign sovereigns? Yeah, so I think it is a very good answer, and, uh, and I, I address that in the book, that there is a counter-argument that all the EU does is that it regulates the single market. It right. is not you could say that conditional lending or conditional trade agreements are more democracy infringing or more kind of manifestations of regulatory imperialism, especially when you negotiate with parties that don't really have a choice when they take the, the, the trade agreement on the, you know, using the terms that the EU basically dictates. But the kind of de facto market space Brussels effect as such is not as sort of, I would say, a pure manifestation of regulatory imperialism. But I think the EU is aware of the effects that it has outside of the world. And the de facto effect is that even if it's not the intention, it's not the process, the outcome is that the European preferences get e exported to parts of the world that do not share those preferences. So by knowing that, the question is whether the EU ought to be thinking about those stakeholders in drafting its, its regulation. And to some extent, when the EU is going through the impact assessment, it is already listening to, to foreign stakeholders. And I think that's important just to have more legitimacy in, in sort of showing self-awareness of the effect that its regulations have. And especially sort of linking to our earlier conversation to make sure that it takes care of the kind of the, the spirit of cooperation, the interest of foreign countries that it is collaborating with. Um, I think it ultimately serves the EU's interest that there is a more collaborative, uh, a more kind of a dialogue-based approach to regulation, which doesn't say that the EU cannot go ahead and regulate its own market the way it needs to regulate it. But I think um, sort of walking through the implications for the rest of the world and engaging those stakeholders that are, whether they want it or not, um, or whether unintentionally or not, um, affected by those policies um, cannot hurt the perception of the EU and ultimately the soft power, the regulatory power and the combination of the other instruments that the EU relies on. Anu, thank you very much. Uh, this has been an amazing hour, at least for me, I guess, for all of our participants. I learned a lot and I also very much appreciate your optimism about the future of the European Union's regulatory power in the world. Before closing this, 
trade talk, just a, a few uh, mention it on, on next events of, of the FIW. So we are actually rather busy in December. So already on Friday and Saturday, we have our next workshop at the Austrian Institute of Economic Research uh, on the topic of gravity at 60, so 60 years of our empirical model for studying trade relationships. And we're going to celebrate the anniversary next week, Monday and Tuesday. We have the next workshop on regional economics at the Vienna University of Economics and Business. And also on Monday, we have the, the next FIW lecture on the future of the automotive industry. So also something where regulation plays a large role, as you have mentioned, for ele electricity, so electric cars and stuff like that. Uh, with it, uh, thanks everybody for tuning in today. Thank you again, Anu, for this very interesting talk. I very much appreciate it. And, uh, have a good day in New York, and uh, I hope I see you soon again. Bye, everybody. Sounds, sounds great. Thank you having, uh, for having me, Harold, and thank you, everyone, for terrific questions. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.